Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafiroff. This show is designed to highlight the work of philanthropic leaders here on the eastern end of Long Island and then beyond. With us today is Mary Crosby. She's the CEO and president of East End Hospice. Mary, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us. And Mary, the first thing, many of our viewers don't even know what hospice is. Could you describe a little bit about what you are and exactly who you're for? Absolutely. So East End Hospice, we're a nonprofit organization. We're coming up on 30 years of working out here on the East End. And we provide care to patients who are terminally ill and their families. And we do that in their homes. We do it in hospitals and nursing homes and also in our CANA Center for Hospice Care, which is an inpatient facility that we built in 2016. So, for example, if I had a mother who was not doing well and she was in her last days, could I reach out to you and you would help me? And what if I didn't have the resources, the financial resources to pay for you? Who would step in? Absolutely. And does insurance help? Absolutely. So we provide a bundle of services. Anyone can call and refer a patient, a loved one, a friend, or a doctor can call. And we come with nursing services, nurses who can come daily if needed, nurses who are on call 24-7, home health aides to help with bathing and personal care. We deliver all the medications and equipment that a person might need to the home so they don't have to go to the pharmacy with no co-pays, even if they have insurance. Um, we also provide volunteers to help go shopping for families, to sit with families and socialize. Um, and all of that um, is covered under Medicare for patients who have Medicare. And if they don't, um, we never deny anyone based on insurance. We uh, depend very heavily on philanthropy to make up the difference. Interesting. And what about um, Medicaid? Does that come in and mm -hmm. Blue Cross and some other insurance carriers? Most of the commercial insurance carriers do cover hospice, um, but again, they cover it about 80% of what it actually costs for us to care for the patients, and that other 20% is where we depend on um, donors and philanthropy. And what if someone's very wealthy? Do most of those people generally pay that 20% or, or they, what happens? Because they really should, right? <laughs> <laughs> we don't ever send a bill to any of our patients. We believe really? that end-of-life care is um, you know, a time in a family's life when they are really facing a great deal of anxiety often and to add to that the pressure or the anxiety of receiving medical bills. Many of our patients have been in the hospital for a prolonged period of time and are still paying bills from their hospital stay. Mm -hmm. So when they really come to hospice, we want, we want to remove that stressor. So we don't, bill, we don't bill the families, we bill the insurance companies and um, the remaining cost to care for the patients is where the donor dollars come in. It's a tough time for most families to see a loved one disintegrate and, and be in their very last days. Now, what about some of the families? Do you find that some of them are very difficult to work with? <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> and do you say get difficult. complaints from some of your workers? <laughs> I wouldn't say very difficult. Um, I certainly, we take care of families from all walks of life. Um, we fly to Fisher's Island, for example, if we have a patient there to care for them. Um, we take care of patients all the way from Shirley and Mastic out to Montauk, um, patients who come to us just for the summer from Florida, from mm -hmm. Palm Beach, or from Manhattan. Um, and we do have a, a, a wide variety of patients. I wouldn't call any of them difficult. Sometimes we call them in the medical field non-compliant. Um, but uh, we're, we're happy to be such a service to this community. And what about staff? Do you get complaints about staff maybe trying to steal or who are disrespectful or even abusive? Does that happen often? That Can you cite any happen. cases? That doesn't happen often. We have our staff, we have such longevity. Uh, we have very, very, nice. very little turnover. And our staff is mostly from the East End, from the communities we serve, and know the communities well, and are well received by the families. So we really don't, we have a 98.5% satisfaction rate among our patients. Well, that's wonderful. And now with home cameras and all other sorts of security, I think workers are more concerned. And of course, Patients need to be concerned too about how they Absolutely. treat someone coming into the house. Mm -hmm. So 
interesting. Now, we are in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, for many people, um, I mean, for most people, this has been a very, very difficult time. I can cite a few people who maybe are profiting from this, um, mm -hmm. uh, certain big businesses, if you're in the mail order business or right. uh, the food chain, you might be profiting. But what about um, hospice and, and what, what has it been like for you to go see these patients and, and to treat them? I would imagine that a lot of the workers are fearful uh, that they could go into a, a home and and perhaps get COVID, or what have you done with COVID-19 patients? So we have cared for patients with COVID-19, patients with suspected COVID-19 who we were not able to test because in um, the beginning of the pandemic, we just didn't have the testing capabilities to do testing in the homes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's changed, I think like most people, the pandemic has changed almost every area of our operations. We have implemented telemedicine to do uh, video, uh, visits with some of our patients who are more stable. And, and how does that work? So we, it's, um, you know, via a platform like Zoom, where we are able to visualize our patients, usually with the help of their caregiver or spouse or loved one, mm -hmm. and do an assessment um, through video. Right. And again, this we sort of reserved for patients who are more stable. Patients who really needed home visits, we went. And we, the nurses were full PPE. Uh, we did have patients with COVID in our inpatient facility. And again, we followed a lot of the same protocols that were followed in the hospitals. And so now you have these, you have an inpatient facility and where is that and how many people do you have in that facility? And if someone really wanted to go there, is there a big wait list? How does that work? So it's in West Hampton, it's eight beds. It's reserved, so it's, small. it's small, but it's reserved for patients who can't be cared for at home because they need a higher level of care more akin to a hospital. They need IV medications or increased oxygen support. Um, and wouldn't they just go to a hospital? Wouldn't a hospital just take them? A hospital could take them, but our facility is absolutely gorgeous. It was designed by Roger Ferris. It's on the water. It is um, just impeccably designed to be so peaceful and tranquil that it's basically the opposite of a hospital in a sense that every person's care is dictated by them and their family. So you eat when you want to eat. Nobody wakes you up in the middle of the night to take your vital signs. It's more of a home-like environment. Each private suite has its own private deck where, with sliding glass doors that open to the outside. Sounds like a um, hotel. <laughs> it, so actually, you can take the whole hospital bed and wheel it outside onto the deck. Um, so it's a nice. totally different kind of care environment. Mm -hmm. It's more conducive to peaceful end-of-life experience. And that's why we try to get our patients there um, rather than in the and, hospital. And I assume you have a wait list. So how do you decide one patient over the other? Sometimes we have a wait list. You know, it's a short stay there. Um, Generally how long? About seven days. So Medicare so dictates um, the criteria mm -hmm. for who we can care for there. Mm -hmm. And so um, there, it's quite a quick turnover, so we can generally accommodate our patients' needs. Mm -hmm. And then how many people are you normally seeing at any one given time in the community? About 80. Right now we're up to 87. We have been, in, we have been at higher numbers since March than we've ever been before um, because there are more people out on the East End and also right. because I think the pandemic really um, sort of triggered people to think about end of life and their choices. And, they, and many people said, you know, my father is very sick. I don't want him to go to the hospital in the middle of a pandemic. I need some sort of help in the home. And mm -hmm. they called us. So mm -hmm. we took on more patients. We had patients transfer from other hospices in other parts of the country. They came to us um, because they were really thinking about how best to care for their loved one in such a difficult time. Right. Now, when someone is uh, ready to pass away and there are young children involved, mm -hmm. generally it's, it's very, very hard on not only the family but the young children. Mm -hmm. And do you have any programs for young children? Because when you think about our country and you think about the world, our children are the future. And if the children are traumatized over death, I mean, it's really a terrible thing. So. Mm -hmm. Do you provide any extra bereavement classes or what do you do for we children? Do. So recently, and this is just an example of sort of the trajectory of our care, we had a 46-year-old woman um, with melanoma who had two young children, two girls, um, and she died Was at she home. married? Yep. So she had a husband, mm -hmm. but still. 
and her mother and husband were caring for her. She wanted to be at home. Mm -hmm. As soon as we take on that case, we immediately place a child bereavement specialist in the home, so who comes sometimes daily to meet with the children and help prepare them for what's to come. After the patient dies, we then continue to see those kids in individual therapy sessions and group therapy sessions. And then we have Camp Good Grief, which is... Um, Tell me a little bit about that because I find yeah. that fascinating. Is it a day camp or a sleepaway camp? What is it exactly? It's a week-long day camp for kids ages 4 to 17 mm -hmm. who have lost a loved one. For many, it's a parent. For some, it's a sibling or cousin or grandparent they were particularly close to. They come and they enjoy this incredible mix of play and fun and then also therapy. So group therapy, art therapy, music therapy. And um, both of these girls came to Camp Good Grief and we did hold it in person this year at the end of July. Mm -hmm. We had about half the number of campers we usually have because we had to comply with COVID restrictions. And it's really a time for kids to be with other kids, to not feel so alone, to share in their grief and to begin the healing process. And how many children are in the camp at one time? Usually it's about 170. So this year a we lot had, of children. We had 85. We had children whose parents were nurses who died from COVID. We had children mm. who had multiple family members die from COVID. We had um, a really special group this year, and they mm -hmm. were really open, and it, it was an incredible experience, as it always is. Let's get back to COVID. What about how do you keep your workers safe? They're going into a home and. Uh, just say I was a nurse mm -hmm. and, and you asked me to treat a COVID patient and, and I'm concerned. Can I refuse a case? You could refuse a case. We work, you know, and again, now that we know so much more about how this disease is transmitted, um, it's helpful in, in keeping people feel feeling safe in the beginning of the pandemic. There was a lot of unknown. For sure. Um, for an organization like ours, we're independent. We're not connected to a larger healthcare entity, so we had to really... Um, fight to get all the PPE we needed for our staff. Uh, we did have staff members who got sick with COVID. Luckily, they all recovered quite quickly and were back to and work. And what did you do? You let them go home and and, and, and rest. And mm -hmm. did they do? You, did they get it from uh, from working in hospice, or did they get it on the outside? Or you can't yeah. say. You can't really say. And, it's hard to and tell. Do you think they're going to be suing you or anything no, like that? No, I don't think that will happen. Again, you know, we have such longevity with our with our staff. They've been with us for so long. There's so much trust. Um, and, you know, we implemented all the safety protocols immediately and we never were short of PPE and we protected our staff to the best extent possible. Um, so it is very difficult to tell where they may have contracted it, um, but we were lucky that everybody had mild cases and were able to come back to work. And I want to ask a little bit about you. I understand you were a nurse at hospice and then um, the head of the nurses before you became the CEO and president of East End Hospice. Did that experience and that work help you become a better leader? Because I think the key to running any organization is really good leadership. And tell me a little bit about your experience as a hospice nurse and as the head of all the nurses, and did that help you? Yes, absolutely. So I began as a field nurse. I took care of patients from Montauk to Southampton, where I live, in their homes. It was my first foray into hospice, and I immediately knew that it was my calling. Uh, it's such a special field to work in. It's tough, and isn't it? It's tough, but there's a difference. You know, when you work in hospitals, you feel like you can never give your patients exactly what they need because you have so many patients and you're so busy and you're running from room to room and you're seeing people in this sort of flash mm -hmm. of their life for a second and That's never right. again. On hospice, you build relationships with people. You get to know them over sometimes years we have patients on hospice and you become like a part of their family. And then you're able to execute their wishes in such a beautiful way because you know them and you're intimately familiar with um, how they lived and how they want to die. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really a special space to be allowed into and an honor to, to care for those patients. Well, it takes a very special person to do that. And Thank you. Did this help you with running East End Hospice, this experience? Yes, I th it absolutely did because knowing how to care for these patients, every decision I make now as CEO, the first question in my mind is how will this impact our patients? How will this help them? 
you know, how do we serve them best in the community? And because I'm so intimately aware of the day-to-day -day operations, it drives almost every decision I make as a leader. And I often say to myself, I could never have done this job if I hadn't grown up sort of within the organization. It, it's helped me tremendously as a leader. And what about balancing your budget? Um, do you think that uh, your nursing helped you? You know, very important for any CEO is to learn how to balance a budget. And yep. in, in philanthropy, if you have a charity, you really need to keep your expenses at 20% or less uh, to get a good rating on some of the uh, charity websites that are instrumental in, in, um, um, in rating the charities, and which are the big ones are GuideStar and Charity Navigator. So what do you do about balancing your budget? I understand you have a $10 million annual budget, yep, which is significant for um, what you do. Yeah, so I think, you know, we're, we have a $10 million budget. We, it's always a challenge with healthcare because healthcare costs are rising and that's, you know. And they're high. They're, they're high. very it's high. Any health, you know, any healthcare entity is facing a similar situation. I think for us, because we have such strong philanthropic support, we're able to go that extra mile. For example, if we have a, pa we had a patient who was 26 years old with sickle cell who lived in a home without air conditioning. We bought an air conditioning. We installed it in, in her home so that you know she could be comfortable. Help her out. And those sort of extra steps, really we never say no to our patients. They need something, they need a Thanksgiving dinner, we're gonna bring it to them. They wanna have a lobster one more time, you know, a last time, we'll do it for them. So going that extra mile and really thinking outside of the box and thinking about really how people live almost more than how they die has, is really only possible because we have such strong philanthropic support. And what percentage are of your $10 million budget comes in from Medicaid and insurance uh, groups? Curious. It's about 80%. 80%, so, it, it, it so then? from 78 to 80%. And then, so two million you go out and raise, and what percentage of that two million comes from the corporate world? The corporate world, we don't have a tremendous amount of support from the corporate world, I'll be honest with you. Most of our um, resource development comes from private foundations and grants, from memorials, mm -hmm. from families, which COVID has impacted greatly because of, at the height of the pandemic, people couldn't really have funerals or memorial services, which is when most people you know, come forward with donations and pass out envelopes and talk about hospice. Um, so that's impacted us. We have fundraising events. Right, and I want to hear a little bit yeah. about them. But yes, yeah, so when someone, if someone has a good experience with hospice, I would think that they might want to donate to you, or maybe if they're writing a last minute will, <laughs> um, they would put you in the will. And yeah. I'm sure you have a lot of that. And we do. Um, mostly, um, the, it'd be nice to get a little more corporate um, uh, funding, I'm sure, sure but it um, <laughs> never hurts. So right. anyone who has a corporation <laughs> out there, there's East End Hospice yeah. and you never know when you might need it. And it, it's just nice to give anyway, because when you give, you get. It's very yeah. rewarding to give. And so, so then you have um, fundraisers, and tell me a little bit about what your top fundraiser is, and were you able to have it this year with the pandemic? I would imagine not, unless you did virtual. Right. Tell me. So we have a summer gala every year, and it's held on a private estate, and is attended to by usually about six, seven hundred people. Which um, is a, a nice size. It's a nice size. It's a dinner party. Uh, we were not able to have it this year. We were actually laughing because early on we secured a date and we thought, oh, well, you know, we'll secure it. We'll postpone it from the end of June to August. And by then all of this will be over. <laughs> and now we're thinking, oh, my goodness, August came and obviously we weren't anywhere near being through the pandemic. So we were not able to have our summer fundraiser. Um, but what did you do in its place? In its place, we did um, two things. We did do some printed material. We sent out a solicitation letter, sort of similar to our annual appeal. We did a journal, as we would normally do for the gala, but it was slightly different this year that we mailed to people's homes. And then we did a digital video where we talked about our response to COVID-19 and we thanked, we featured some of our donors, we featured some of our staff, and we talked about our experience through the pandemic. And what did you raise through this process? We, I, I'll have to say that we're, 
the numbers have not been finalized, but it's pretty close to what we raised having the event last year because the ex we didn't have the expenditure of such a large party. So. Yes, I have a feeling that a lot of charities are going to reevaluate whether the big galas are, are right. meaningful and whether they actually need them to carry on operations because if you can raise the same amount of money without having the gala, well, you might want to do that. And, right. But it, it's questionable because especially here on the eastern end of Long Island, people love to go to a party a party for charity, a party for anything. Yeah. Uh, Hamptonites love parties. So. Yeah, and I think it helps people feel connected to see one another I think face so. to face and I to think hear so. about the agency. You know, there's something that's lost, I mean, a connectivity that's been lost everywhere because of the pandemic. We, you know, we're living in this different world now where connections are, are really fading in many ways. And I think coming together is such a big part of that. So even though it is not the most efficient way to fundraise, and we will have to sort of rethink that model it Next is, year. It is, you know, people have been coming to our tent party for close to 30 years. Sure. And they always call it the last great tent party in Quag because we're, the, you know, still doing it. And it's hard to think of that going away, but it is easy to think about changing it slightly. Yes, Stony Brook Southampton Hospital has a great gala every they year. Do. And being a board member and being someone who's chaired that gala three times and a past honoree, um, I like the galas. Yeah. I enjoy them. But uh, this year, of course, we couldn't do it. Uh, we had little galas in our gardens. There were I 40 different parties. Idea. And we didn't raise the same amount of money, but we had um, very strict rules on us. And mm -hmm. I think it was very successful yeah. nonetheless. So, yeah. And then um, another question. Sure. Um, I'm somebody and I want to use hospice, but I'm embarrassed. Do you have that too, where people say, well, we're a family, we're a strong family, we can do this on their own. What would you say to these people who, who feel uncomfortable about reaching out to you? Sure. Well, I'll start by saying that New York has the lowest hospice utilization rate of almost any state. We're ranked and why do you 48th. Think and why is that, do you think? It's a, you know, no one has really come up with an answer. I'm on a legislative committee where we go to Albany and we lobby and we, we talk to, you know, our assembly members about hospice and, and how we can change certain issues to make hospice more um, utilized by our constituency. And they haven't really figured out. A, a lot of it has to do with some, with patients going to nursing homes when they should really be coming on hospice and how that discharge process works. I don't think anyone has a firm idea. But we do know that it's underutilized. And so, so much of what I'm doing as president and CEO is getting out there and talking to people much like this to tell them what our services are, how you qualify for them, so that people understand it sort of demystifies hospice. And they, they recognize that we're an added layer of support in your home. And, um, you know, you may not think that you need it, but caring for people at end of life is, is, is challenging for anybody, regardless of the means that you have. It's emotionally challenging. It can be physically challenging. And so what we offer is really such a safety net for these families, just to be able to pick up the phone one o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and call someone and have them come to your house because you're in pain or you have some new symptom that you've never had before, or you're scared. I mean, this is the service that we offer to people. And, and I think anyone could benefit from it who's terminally ill. Well, I happen to agree. I remember when my mother passed away many years ago, and she had cancer, and her last days were, they were brutal on us. So I, I definitely see um, the value of having someone come into the home and help out and give a little care. And finally, we have a few minutes left. I want to talk a little bit about you, your, you and your family, the Katina family. You've been on the east end of Long Island for years and years. Um, what advice would you give to all the summer people who are here? And I always say we come into a community. We are the outsiders. Of course, we've had our, ham our house here for 25 years. Mm -hmm. But what advice would you give? And then I want you to give the website for how to donate sure, absolutely. and volunteer. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's, you know, it's advice that I take myself when I'm traveling and that I, you know, for anyone who's going into a new community to really stop and look and listen and get to know 
the who people. the key players are. You know, people came out here during the pandemic with the best of intentions and wanted to do things and start initiatives. And it was all with such good intentions and many of it led to great things happening. Um, but sometimes people didn't take that extra step to say, let's see what's out here first before we try to create something new. You know, let's see, let's get to learn the local community and see the resources they have and see how we can help existing resources without, you know, recreating the wheel. Right, and I personally think it's very important for people when you go into a community to support the local charities because the local charities are, are very important not only to the people that live here year-round, but to the people that come here for the summer. And finally, I wanted to ask you a little bit about volunteers. We have just about a minute left. Okay. Quickly, can I volunteer? Can someone else volunteer? Unfortunately, yeah. I have very little time yes. in my life right at this moment. But how do you do that, and how do we donate? We have a roster of 150 volunteers, so we have a huge volunteer base. You do have to take a training. Um, we're doing it now online, um, just a bereavement training and a hospice training to be able to volunteer. But And how um, long does that take? Is it it's, weeks or it, months? It's about six weeks, Okay. Um, and it's three, three or so hours a week. Okay, um, not, that's not too much. So we do rely very heavily on volunteers as a part of our core services. Um, and anyone can volunteer as long as you take the training. Well, that's wonderful. And yeah. what is the website to donate? The website donate? is eeh.org. Repeat it again. eeh.org for eastendhospice.org. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Mary. And this concludes this segment of Successful Philanthropy. My guest, Mary Crosby, CEO and President of East End Hospice. Thank you all for tuning in and see you next week.